Until about 200 years ago, we humans largely depended for our energy needs on our own muscles, on animals, and on burning wood. When we ran short of wood, we discovered a marvelous source of energy stored in fossil fuels, coal, gas, and oil. Fossil fuels are nothing more than the transformed remains of plants and animals that died millions of years ago. When we burn them, we release the energy of the ancient sunlight that helped create them in the first place. But we have come to be dangerously dependent on fossil fuels, even addicted to them. Not only does that accelerate global warming, we're likely to run out of cheap oil and gas by mid-century. Coal, though much more abundant, is highly toxic. So we must do something urgently. In the developed world, we must learn to use less energy. A 50% reduction may be necessary. And we must turn increasingly to renewable energy sources. One of our most promising solutions may be to turn back to our old friend, the sun. Do you know that the solar energy that strikes the Earth's surface for one hour is enough to feed the world's current electricity needs for one year? So, why haven't we gone solar already? I mean, it's pollution-free, there's no global warming, there's no dependence on foreign oil powers, it's decentralized, so it's virtually terrorist-proof, and effectively, there's an infinite supply. I mean, it sounds like the dream solution, doesn't it? But will it work? This film's all about sunlight, what it is, how we are learning to use it, and what the future may hold. Our story starts, however, long ago and far away. Many ancient peoples worshipped the sun. The Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten founded the first religion in history to have a single god, and that god was the sun. The writers of the Bible acknowledged its primacy by having God's first instruction be, let there be light. But what exactly was this stuff light? No one had any clear idea until the eminent English scientist Isaac Newton took an educated guess about 300 years ago and wrote, are not the rays of light very small bodies emitted from shining substances? Well, Newton's idea of light was really quite a simple one. He thought that light consisted of a stream of particles that, uh, as he knew, traveled in straight lines. Newton's guess was a good one, as Einstein would later show. But a very different guess was made by a Dutchman, Christian Huygens. Huygens observed the waves made by a stone dropped in water. He had a brilliant insight, suggesting that light, as he said, spreads by spherical surfaces and waves. Here's a drawing that Huygens made to illustrate waves of light flowing from a candle. Huygens had created the wave theory of light, but like Newton, he couldn't back up his theory with experimental results. And so things stood until 1803, when a Londoner called Thomas Young was invited to make a presentation on light in the famous lecture theatre at the Royal Institution. The Royal Institution was founded in 1799, immediately a big hit. Uh, people came to be educated, to see, to learn about science. It was almost evidently like a magic show. These physics students at Stanford University are replicating one of Thomas Young's experiments. Right, 
a ring stand for the laser. Light from a single source must enter two narrow slits and eventually hit a screen some distance away. The reason that Young did this experiment was to try to see if light was a wave or a particle. Was Newton right or Huygens? The light from each slit spreads out like waves of water. Each wave interferes with the others, creating a pattern of light and dark patches. All across that second screen, its intensity varied across the screen in a very regular way. And that could be perfectly naturally explained by the wave theory and couldn't be explained at all by Newton's theory. So Christian Huygens' theory was right. Light is a wave. But that's not the end of the story. In the early 19th century, no one thought there was much connection between light, electricity and magnetism. They seem like three very different phenomena. Then, here at the Royal Institution, a young scientist called Michael Faraday started doing experiments with an electromagnet, and he discovered that electricity and magnetism were two sides of the same coin. Another British scientist, James Clark Maxwell, then set out to formulate Faraday's findings mathematically, and his equations predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. So Maxwell discovered electromagnetic waves mathematically. He calculated the speed of these waves, and he noticed that it was exactly the same as the speed of light that had previously been measured. So suddenly, he finds himself confronted with this fact that light is a wave phenomenon, and it is an electromagnetic wave phenomenon. Uh, one of the uh, great insights of uh, natural science. German scientist Heinrich Hertz experimented by shining lights on electrical circuits, and results seem to confirm Maxwell's theory. Our knowledge is complete, said Hertz. A refutation of these views is unthinkable. The wave theory of light is a certainty. However, Hertz's assistant, Philip Lennart, decided to look more closely at one of the experiments where there was a gap in the electrical circuit. Different colors across the gap. Right now there's no high voltage, so you don't see anything happening. Uh, let's go ahead and fire up the high voltage. Okay. Lennart found that if he shone light at low frequencies, red, green or blue, on these two metal balls, nothing happened. But if the light was above a certain frequency, into the ultraviolet, electrons escaped from the metal and jumped across the gap, completing the circuit and creating a spark. Now, that didn't sound like the action of a wave. Now, this doesn't make any sense. A threshold, a sudden change, going from violet to ultraviolet, if light is a wave, smooth and continuous in how it delivers its energy. But if light is a particle, a threshold makes a lot more sense. Here was an incredible paradox because so many experiments could apparently only be explained by the wave theory, but here there was this new class of experiments that could very easily be explained by particle theory but not by the wave theory. What to do with this? No one could have predicted the problem would be solved by a patent office clerk in Switzerland. But that's what Albert Einstein was when he came up with the answer. In 1905, Einstein had the revolutionary insight that light has a dual nature. In some contexts, as Maxwell and Hertz had shown, it was a wave. But in others, as in Lennart's measurements, it consisted of discrete quanta of energy, or photons. The higher the frequency, the greater their energy. Amazingly, Newton and Huygens had both been correct. 
An experiment using modern equipment at Stanford shows very clearly that Einstein was right. What we want to do is we want to observe single photons. So what we have here is we have a very sensitive photo detector and it's connected to these optics through this fiber optic cable which basically just funnels light into the detector. So we actually need to cover up these optics and we need to actually shut the room lights off and I'll use this flashlight as a light source to get photons into the detector. In darkness, you hear no evidence of photons striking the detector. As the light becomes stronger, you hear a growing rush of photons. When the light is dimmed, there are fewer and fewer photons reaching the detector until you begin to hear the photons one by one. So this shows that Einstein was right and light is indeed made up of particles. But nobody else could understand how light could be both a wave and a particle. Not even the famous physicist Max Planck. We know today the letter that Max Planck wrote to recommend Einstein. And in this letter he says many complimentary things about Einstein. And then he comes to Einstein's theory of the photon and he says, you should forgive Einstein, even a very great man can make a big mistake occasionally. And of course, eventually Einstein got his Nobel Prize for that work. It wasn't relativity that won him his Nobel Prize, it was what he called the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is really the stroke of genius. It took courage, of course, also took insight and this genius touch. As I emphasize again, that transcends simple analysis and mere logic. And that is what is truly great about this great mind. The entire history and development of modern work on solar electricity depends on Einstein's understanding of this photoelectric effect. In this context, light consists of lots of individual packets of energy, ready to react with whatever they strike. Einstein's insight had set the stage for the future advent of solar power. In the mid-20th century, some of the greatest developments in applied technology were made at Bell Labs, the Bell Telephone Laboratories in New Jersey. Here, in 1947, William Shockley, John Bardeen and others developed the transistor, the most important electronic discovery of the century. It was both a switch and an amplifier, and it transformed everything from telephones to computing. It revolutionised everything. You can really speak uh, of uh, the world before the transistor and the world after the transistor. Dr. Walter Cohn worked here as a young man in the 1950s. Well, the first time I came to Bell Labs, it felt like in a very intimidating place. It was known to everybody in physics as the number one laboratory in the world. My recollection is that there were approximately 3,000 people working here. You know, everybody was doing his thing, but everybody was connected to other people who were doing their things. It was this connection that brought together the work of three scientists to create the world's first practical solar cell. Here are the inventors of the Bell Solar Battery. Darrell Chapin was an electrical engineer. He'd been experimenting with early selenium cells for powering telephone lines in remote areas. A physicist, Gerald Pearson, was trying to develop a rectifier to replace mechanical telephone switching devices. And a chemist, Calvin Fuller, was working with the semiconductor silicon as part of the transistor project. Bell scientists like silicon because of its electronic characteristics and because it was abundant. It's basically sand and makes up more than one quarter of the Earth's surface. A single atom of silicon has four active electrons, which are called valence electrons. 
In a crystal of silicon, each of these valence electrons, together with a valence electron of a neighboring silicon atom, forms a bond joining those two atoms. However perfect it looks, solid silicon, like all semiconductors, doesn't work electronically unless a small fraction of the silicon atoms are replaced by foreign atoms called impurities. Pure silicon is one of the dullest substances you could imagine. It does very little of interest. You introduce these minuscule fractions of impurities, and I say minuscule, part in a million, part in a billion atoms. Suddenly, all kinds of exciting things can be made to happen. The chemist, Calvin Fuller, developed a highly controlled process for diffusing impurities into silicon. Take phosphorus, for example. It has five valence electrons, one more than silicon and the core has one more positive charge than silicon. If you substitute an atom of phosphorus in a crystal of silicon, the extra electron, carrying a negative charge, will move around in the crystal. Silicon with these extra negative electrons is called n-type silicon. If you add a boron atom, which has one less valence electron than silicon, you are left with a missing electron called a hole. This too can move around in the crystal. Because the hole represents a missing electron, it has a net positive charge. This gives us p-type silicon. Gerald Pearson used Fuller's technique to make silicon rectifiers. He created something called a p-n junction. To make a p-n junction, you take a slab of silicon. You make one side of it n-type and the other side of it p-type. Between these two layers, a transition region develops with a permanent electric force field. Holes drifting into this region will get a kick to the p-side and the electrons to the n-side. And then something serendipitous happened. Pearson exposed one of his silicon rectifiers to a light source. He shone some light on a piece of silicon with a PN junction and discovered that he could get a unknown level of electric current and uh, realized immediately that this had tremendous implications so what was happening? Well, if you shine a light on a PN junction, you are firing photons at it. Each photon excites one electron hole pair. The electrons accelerate in one direction across the junction and the holes in the other. All that remained for Pearson was to complete an electrical circuit from one side of the silicon to the other, then shine a light and measure the electric current that flowed. It worked. What I'm holding in my hands is the first battery and it states the power that it produces. Not very impressive, but it's the beginning, one-tenth of a watt. In this modern age, men have at last harnessed the sun with the Bell solar battery. On April the 25th, 1954, Bell Telephone executives unveiled the new power photo cells. Here are the inventors making a test of their newly harnessed power to operate a small radio transmitter. This is a demonstration of the Bell solar battery in practical application. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? It made an enormous impact on the press. That understandably went overboard. They had a huge press conference in uh, New York. They had a uh, light uh, shining on the silicon solar cells, uh, powering a little Ferris wheel that was made from an erector set. And the reporters who came had these great dreams that these little strips of silicon would produce more power than all the uranium, all the oil, and all the um, gas. Here, this door was opened uh, and 
uh, human imagination could see all kinds of future possibilities. But the first solar cells that were made uh, were enormously expensive, so that the electricity that you got out of it was a hundred, a thousand times more expensive than the electricity you got from your standard power station where you burned uh, uh, coal or gas. So what exactly could the miraculous new power source be used for? Because of their great expense and low power output, early solar cells seem destined to remain a novelty, powering transistor radios and toys and a few highly specialised applications. The phone company, which had paid for the research, installed solar power experimentally on remote phone lines in Georgia. But was that all it could be used for? It was just going to be thrown in the dustbin of history when the Pentagon came to Bell Laboratories. It turned out that there was an application on the horizon right then and there for which the standard uh, sources of electricity just were out of the question and solar cells were exactly what was needed. And those were applications for space exploration. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first man-made satellite, Sputnik. It caused consternation in the US. The Soviets were in the lead in the so-called space race. But Sputnik stopped transmitting after several weeks for the simple reason that its batteries ran out. So, what was the alternative? There were a variety of uh, power sources, but they all uh, died out over time. The batteries had to be recharged in some way, and they couldn't be recharged. It was a natural for solar energy. Uh, the satellite is up there in the sun all the time. Uh, even if it's inefficient, uh, there's energy that you can count upon. It was proof that this is a viable technology. It lasted longer than the satellites. This was the beginning of the, of, of the new age uh, of solar photo, uh, photovoltaic effect. The eagle has wings. By the time we went to the moon, ten years later, it was accepted wisdom that solar or photovoltaic cells were the best way to go. The solar panel industry at that time for space was like a jewelry business. All the parts were made by hand, they were inspected multiple times, there were 300 steps in making every one, and each solar panel is a work of art, it's very special. Reliability and durability were, and still are, the overriding requirements in space. The cost of solar panels is insignificant compared to the overall cost of a satellite. Today, solar-powered satellites connect vast numbers of communications networks. They coordinate transportation. They keep us informed on television. Nearly every cell phone call passes through solar-powered equipment. Modern life would be unthinkable without it. But down here on Earth, the bean counters are more rigorous. If solar is to be an option, it has to be more convenient or cheaper than what's already on offer. That's why, ironically, it was the oil companies that became the first major industrial users of solar power. Offshore oil rigs need electricity to run warning lights and horns, and there's no power grid out at sea. Solar panels, combined with small storage batteries, made practical and economic sense to the Coast Guard, too. Today, 99% of all their navigation aids, including lighthouses and buoys, rely on solar electricity. The more remote the location, the greater the need for photovoltaics. Railroads power distant switches and signals with solar panels. The phone company powers microwave relay stations in the mountains. 
And airfields can operate 24 hours a day wherever they are, thanks to handy devices like these self-contained blue landing lights. A simple solar panel, the mountains are an excellent place to collect uh, solar activity, and they use LED lights on the interior of the lens. A phenolic lens distributes that small amount of light to make it look like a regular taxiway light. Here at California's Truckee Tahoe Airport, it would have cost them more than a million dollars to connect their lights to the grid. Solar units cost just 135000 We also reduced the time for installation from two years to uh, one month. In addition to that, the ongoing savings is about $18,000 a year. The future of solar power for remote installations looks good. But will it become a major part of the world's energy mix? That depends on people like Terry Jester. She's worked in photovoltaics since the 1970s. It was just an amazing time to be part of a group of people uh, working 80, 90 hour weeks, feeling so committed. and feeling like what we were doing and what we could do would change the world and change the future. Terry Jester is director of operations at this factory, which is now owned by Shell. It has been making solar panels for more than 25 years. The whole time, the primary target has been to cut costs.